Απόψε έχουμε τη χαρά και την τιμή να φιλοξενούμε δύο εξέχοντες προσωπικότητες της Αιγαϊκής Προϊστορίας, τον Brendan Berg και τον Brian Burns, συνδιευθυντές του αρχαιολογικού προγράμματος της Ανατολικής Βιωτίας, μια συνεργασία του Καναδικού Ινστιτούτου με την Ένατη Εφορία Αρχαιοτήτων. Θα μας μιλήσουν για τα μυκηναϊκά ευρήματα από τις έρευνες αυτού του προγράμματος στο βιωτικό ελαιόνα που έρχεται να συμπληρώσει τις σημαντικές αλλά δυστυχώς αποσπασματικές μαρτυρίες για τη μυκηναϊκή βιωτία. Για όσους δεν γνωρίζουν καλά τους ομιλητές, ο Μπρέντεν, που θα είναι ο κύριος ο ομιλητής στη, στην κοινή ανακοίνωση, έχει ήδη ένα τεράστιο και πολυσχηδές έργο. Αν θέλουμε να εστιάσουμε στις επιμέρους θεματικές ενότητες, τέσσερις είναι οι κύριοι άξονες του ερευνητικού του πεδίου, η αρχαιολογία της βιωτίας, η εποχή του Σιδήρου στην Ανατολία, το βασίλειο του Μίδα στο Γόρδιο και η οικονομία της υφαντικής παραγωγής. Με ε, μερικές πολύ πρωτότυπες, όπως μαθαίνουμε, εργασίες επί του πιεστηρίου. Ο Μπρένταν Δουλ ε, σπούδασε κλασικές σπουδέ στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Φλόριντα. Το διδακτορικό του στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Καλιφόρνια είχε ως θέμα την οργάνωση της υφαντικής παραγωγής στο Αιγαίο και την Ανατολία. Είναι μέλος της Αμερικανικής ε, Σχολής Κλασικών Σπουδών, όπου και δίδαξε το 2002 και 2003. Σήμερα διδάσκει στην έδρα ελληνικών και ρωμαϊκών σπουδών του Πανεπιστήμιου, Πανεπιστήμιου της Βικτόρια. Εκτός από τον Ελαιόνα και το Γόρδιο, που είναι τα κύρια ερευνητικά προγράμματα όπου έχει εργαστεί, έχει συμμετάσχει σε πολλές άλλες έρευνες πεδίου, στη Λευκάδα, τα Μέθανα, την Κορινθία, το Καραμάν, ε, Καραμάν Μαράς, αλλά και στην Ιρλανδία και την Αμερική. Ο Μπράιν Μπέρνς έχει ως κύριο θέμα ε, έρευνα στην αρχαιολογία του προϊστορικού Αιγαίου και ειδικεύεται στην αρχιτεκτονική και τα εμπορικά δίκτυα της ύστερης χαλκοκρατίας. Διδάσκει ελληνική και ρωμαϊκή αρχαιολογία στο κολέγιο Wellesley στη Μασαχουσέτη και συνδιευθύνει το Λάμδα Classical Cocos, Cocos, ένα παρακλάδι της Αμερικανικής Φιλολογικής Εταιρείας που έχει στόχο στο γεφ, το γεφύρωμα των κλασικών σπουδών με τις σπουδές του κοινωνικού φύλου και την ιστορία της σεξουαλικότητας. Παρακαλούμε, Μπρέντον. I think I'm on. He told me he was on. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you for that very, very nice introduction for both of us. We really appreciate it. And thank you for the invitation to speak here. It's very nice to be able to come back to Athens and see so many familiar faces. So <clears throat> I will begin. The Eastern Boeotia Archaeological Project is a synergasia between the Canadian Institute in Greece and the Ephorate of Antiquities of Boeotia, formerly the Ninth Ephorate. Uh, since 2011, our work has focused on the ancient site of Elion in the village of Arma. We worked in a previous collaboration with Vasilis Aravantinos and Yanis Fapas and Susan Lupak. Uh, since 2012, the Synergasia has been co-directed by Alexander Harami of the Efferet and the Thebes Museum. Brian Burns and, and I are, are in collaboration with Mrs. Harami. Uh, and we also thank the, the extensive help we received from Olga Kiriadzi as well. We are very grateful for the significant research funding we have received from an insight grant from the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council of Canada, also known as SHRC, uh, the Institute for Aegean Prehistory, and the Loeb Classical Library Foundation. So you can see our team from the last few years. This is our most late, our recent team in 2014. Uh, in the talk tonight, we will focus on the Mycenaean age at Elion. In the palatial period, we understand this site to be a secondary site uh, within the administrative network centered around the, the major city and palace at Thebes. Activity at the site is strong also in the post-palatial period as well, uh, with evidence suggesting a shift in network ties along the Euboean Gulf. We have three main objectives tonight. Uh, first, we will outline the context of the excavation and the results of the project. Uh, we will give an assessment of the LH3B and 3C remains, which well document the significant changes that are occurring in Mycenaean Boeotia. 
and we will conclude with an examination of the later use of the site by classical Greeks who seem to have been as interested in with their Bronze Age past as those of us here tonight. The, this year, we are also very happy to report that the land purchase at Arma and the transfer of title from private ownership to state property has been concluded. Uh, and we're very grateful to the Canadian Institute in Greece and our legal help from Nicholas Nicolaides uh, during this long process for the tra uh, land transfer. You can see the area that we'll be working in here in, in, green, in blue. The archaeological site we identify as ancient Elion is located on a natural outcrop of limestone on the northwest side of modern Arma, 14 kilometers east of Thebes. At its highest point, 265 meters above sea level, it is possible to look out over the plain in all directions, including north to the Epitus mountain range and the routes linking Thebes to the Euboean Gulf and Attica. Chalkis and the island of Euboea are visible to the east in this direction. The identification of the archaeological site with the ancient toponym of Elion relies heavily on the geographer Strabo, who, st who states that, quote, Helion, a Tanagrian village, has its name from the marshes, Hele, there. Strabo also twice designates Helion as belonging to the region of Tanagra. In one of these references, he lists Elion among four villages, or Tetracomia, near Tanagra, Helion, Arma, Mikalisos, and Farai. Uh, the early 19th century traveler William Leake identified an archaeological site northwest of the village of Dritza as the remains of a small Hellenic polis, or fortified Kome. Working from Leek and Strabo, it was Ulrichs in 1863 who first identified the Acropolis outside of Dritza, the, the village we now call Arma, uh, as the site of ancient Elion. Aside from Strabo's topographical descriptions, very little is known of Elion from classical authors. It occurs in the catalog of ships and again in the Iliad as a source of Odysseus's boar's tusk helmet. Uh, and we actually have a fragment of a boar's tusk helmet, kind of remarkably. Um, Herodotus and Pausanias uh, name men from Elion who were famous as prophets, and which suggests that there might have been some oracle here or at, at the site and a cult uh, devoted to the daughters of the Scamander River. The uh, documents in Linear B are of key importance for recreating the geography of the Mycenaean Boeotia, of course, as we all, as we all know. The tablets often record a list of place names and agricultural production, allowing us to reconstruct a breakdown of the regional Mycenaean territories. The extent of the kingdom at Thebes is a vexing, vexing question. Uh, the question is, was the kingdom of Cadmus restricted to a 20 kilometer zone around Thebes, as some scholars have suggested, or was it greater, since references in the Linear B tablets from Thebes refer to places like Karistos, Amarinthos, and even a place that sounds a lot like Aphaia. So that may even include uh, the area we're in right now in Athens. Mycenaean Elion is attested on a Linear B tablet from the arsenal, demonstrating a role, the role of secondary centers in the economic geography of the Theban kingdom. Uh, tablet FT140 is a page-shaped tablet that records five different toponyms in the nominative or dative uh, locative case followed by substantial quantities of wheat and, on all but line four, olives. So three of the five toponyms have been read. On line one, we can see Thebes, Eutresis, or Eutereu on line two, and then on line five, we have Ereoni, or Eleon. The, the list here uh, was probably made up to indicate the tax in terms of gras or, or grain, and olives that each of these places had to contribute to Thebes. And the sums recorded are actually very substantial. This is about 10,000 liters of grain and about twice that in olives that are assessed in this, uh, just this one tablet. So these are the place names, as you can see, from this one tablet on the map there. So with this understanding of secondary centers in Boeotia, we conducted a systematic survey between 2007 and 2009. And you can see our funding agencies there and our collaborators. The survey area consisted of a 10 by 16 kilometer portion of the agricultural plain east of Thebes. 
The survey zone was chosen in part because of the important ancient sites already documented within the region. First among them, of course, is the uh, famous Bronze Age site of Tanagra, where excavations uh, of two Mycenaean cemeteries located at Yefira and Dendron produced the well-known painted Larnakes now in the Archaeological Museum of Thebes, the Schematari Museum, and also in private collections. The other major site in this area is identified as ancient Elion in nearby Arma, long known because of its uh, significant standing remains. Uh, standing features include a medieval tower on the west end of the Acropolis and an impressive polygonal wall of archaic date uh, along the east. Except for brief explorations in the 1930s, no significant work has been done at the site before our project. Uh, one of our goals was to understand Elion's chronology and material culture. So here from our survey, I can just briefly show you a distribution map of the Bronze Age pottery that we recorded around the Acropolis and its various concentrations. And then also here is just a selection of our, our survey sherds from the earliest uh, Bronze Age material all the way through the archaic and uh, into the classical period as well. So this is what we were this is what we were was indicated to us from the survey, and so in um, 2011 uh, we began trial excavations. We started in the southern area of the site uh, in this part uh, because of anomalous indications from geophysical work done by Professor Gregorius Sokas of Aristotle University, and that work was done in October of, of 2009. So the electroresistivity mapping suggested several subsurface structures, and you can see some of the outlines here, and this is the uh, view as well. The nature of the readings was such that, the, uh, that ground truthing was necessary. We wanted to compare the geophysical results with actual excavation. And so uh, by the end of 2014, our work has now yielded uh, material covering a long chronological range uh, from the Middle Bronze Age through the Ottoman period. And so you can see this is where the uh, geophysical work uh, was conducted. And these are some areas in the north and, and, and other parts of the site. Uh, so before I begin the chronological review of our Bronze Age material, uh, let me orient you to our areas of excavation. Uh, this is the area known as we call the northwest, this is the southwest, and then this is the southeast. And I'll be going through and highlight some of the finds from each of those three areas tonight. <clears throat> You can see that we've begun to experiment with uh, drone technology as well for aerial photography, uh, but we really must thank our friends and, and uh, landlords in, in Delacy and the family of the Mamonis, Giorgos Mamonis, and his uh, remote-controlled plane who was extremely helpful to us and provided much of the aerial imagery you'll see tonight. So, so to review the overall periods of, uh, that are present at our site, uh, the earliest levels we have uh, may be funerary. Uh, middle Helladic burials and associated ceramics have been found at our site. A clay-lined uh, cyst tomb contained the intact remains of a child. Uh, the tomb near, uh, was nearly disturbed by a very large pit that you see here, but the tomb itself uh, and the contents uh, were undisturbed. Uh, nearby, were another set of uh, cyst tombs with stone line bins. And you can see those here. And this is the, the other clay line bin is just over here. So it's not too far distant. Uh, these were both found in 2014. Uh, and they contained contaminated later remains and were clearly uh, disturbed and, and un emptied uh, long ago. So elsewhere, a, a fair quantity of middle Helladic and early Mycenaean material has been found uh, at our site, including Matte painted cups of both vafio and globular type, uh, bichrome pottery typical of central Greece, as well as a characteristic hawk's beak rim crater. Also known uh, but rare are imports from Egina, including a red slipped and burnished crater. The earliest material in the Mycenaean style begins with a few pieces dated, datable to the LH2A period, including a bell cup with scale pattern, a piriform jar decorated in a strongly reminiscent Middle Helladic style, uh, a bichrome jar in the southwest uh, that you can see being excavated here. Only by the LH3B period uh, does pottery in the Mycenaean tradition become uh, more common and um, standardized. So in the northwest, uh, we have some evidence for palatial period activity. 
Uh, most of the 3A and 3B1 pottery derives from fills below later floors, which you can see in these two uh, areas of, of the Northwest. Um, these were walking surfaces excavated uh, at, that resulted in pottery that was very fragmentary, and in most cases, no substantial profiles could be restored. The most complete vessel we have is a deep bowl datable to LH3B1, uh, but this does come from a disturbed context, as I said. Open shapes uh, dominate the material inventoried thus far, uh, mostly deep and stemmed bowls, kylikes, and mugs. The only closed shapes in this selection is a small pattern uh, juglet, which you can see here. At this point in our excavation, we have only isolated areas with palatial period architecture and associated finds because of the rebuilding by the LH3C occupants. The western wall of the building uh, is not fully uh, preserved, as you can see here. This is the west side of this northwest uh, unit. A series of slabs are positioned further west at the level of the initial construction phase, suggesting a much more complicated um, earlier uh, building complex below from the 3B period. The floor levels associated with this phase have been difficult to isolate, though there is some evidence for craft activities like cloth production. In addition, in this area, uh, we have one of our most spectacular finds from 2014, a stone jewelry mold. Uh, this red steatite mold, which you can see here, is typical for Mycenaean uh, glass uh, making. And we have some glass beads from Elion, which you can see here. Um, but it is also possible these, this mold could have been used for uh, precious metals, like gold. So uh, as you can see, this mold came, the, the beads from Thebes, which you see here, have a pretty striking uh, correspondence to this uh, to the mold we have from um, from Elion. So we found that's pretty spectacular <clears throat> in terms of our results from this past summer. But the mold was found on a level sealed beneath uh, further uh, LH3C early destruction uh, and suggests new possibilities for the range of material connections and activities at Elion within the network of the Theban administration during the palatial period. So this is what I wanted to highlight, is that these, at, these finds are date to the period when the palace at Thebes was still thriving, and this is the period of the Linear B tablets, for example. So <clears throat> the most coherent phase that we have, though, in the Northwest and also at the site in general dates to the 3C early period. So in the Northwest, uh, the large structure, uh, which you can see here, uh, measures approximately 11 by 14 meters. Uh, though it co clearly continues to the north uh, with this western wall that uh, continues into the scarp. The northern section is divided into two rooms, which you can see here, uh, and each of them is positioned with a, or has a central hearth. The past season, in the past season, we stopped excavation within these rooms upon reaching this upper level uh, so that we were able to uh, maintain the integrity of the wall and also create a comprehensive and coherent uh, chronological level for this, for this unit. Outside the northwest uh, room, which you can see here, and you can see here, uh, we found a ramp uh, which was leading into this large um, central room. To the west, uh, a large open space held concentrations of animal bone and pottery consistent with refuse deposits. So that would be along uh, this exterior surface. Two major phases so it have been now uh, isolated for this building. A lower level uh, preserves unburnt pottery with the predominance of decorated fine wares. That's what you can see here. Uh, this, combined with the relatively limited evidence for storage and cooking, suggests the functions of the rooms was different from this period to the next, uh, the next destruction, the burnt level, that I'll talk about in just a second. So from the unburnt phases or deposits, uh, we have uh, numerous deep bowls, including an exceptional piece decorated with an elaborate spiral, which you can see here, uh, monochrome carinated cups, and a one-handled bowl. A variety of craters uh, with monochrome interiors is also present. Uh, good diagnostics for a 3C early date also uh, includes a, a largely restorable calithos with dotted rim, which you see here, and a, a distinctive use wear pattern. Uh, the carinated cups leave no doubt as to the LH3C early date for this horizon. 
And our, we are incredibly grateful, of course, to our ceramic experts, uh, Bartek Liss and Trevor Van Dam, uh, who have now suggested uh, uh, the best synchronization for this period uh, is with Lefkan D uh, phase 1A. The floor level beneath this collapse contained fineware ceramics, cooking, and storage wares. Um, also with it, though, were copper alloy blades, which you can see here, pretty well preserved, and textile tools, a large number of spinning and weaving equipment. In, a, in an adjacent space to the east, continued industrial activity is indicated by a series of six hearths positioned around a central stone, which you can see here, uh, presumably supporting the roof. The southern half of the, roof was, of the room was unroofed since the largest hearths are clustered here, including three that are built directly on top of, of another. So we have a whole series of these uh, plaster hearths in this part of the building. So the building's second phase, the burnt destruction level, uh, provides its, the best evidence for its use and destruction in the 3C early period, the end of the period. So in room one, as delimited by walls of the north and the west, we uncovered a sunken basin and a tile hearth, uh, and within was an extensive ceramic assemblage that included 18 complete or well-preserved pots, three jugs and a hydria, four deep bowls, three kylikes, two cooking pots, a dipper, and a kalathos. A large number of serving and drinking vessels are complemented by those necessary for storage and food processing. The three linear kylikes uh, may have fallen from above, and you can see their excavation here, uh, from a shelf that, lit, that stood above this uh, lacane. And here are the um, kylikes again, and uh, yeah, I'm holding them there. <laughs> Um, also present are pattern craters and what is, for us, the earliest LH3C pictorial crater identified at Elion, featuring a bird tucked beneath a probable antithetic uh, spiral. You can just make out the spiral there, and this is that, that little bird. So this final phase in the Northwest saw a reconstruction that selectively built around the earlier remains leaving a collapsed deposit of wall stones, mud bricks, and roofing material accumulated in the center of the room. The excavations yielded 225 kilograms of burnt clay. This included mud brick, slabs of wall pavement, and chunks of daub with reed impressions. And you can see in the scarp, too, more of that uh, uh, destruction debris. And here's one of the buckets full of this uh, burnt clay material. We also have evidence for pitched roofs uh, the remains of at least six separate pan tiles, as well as some corresponding cover tiles, uh, were recovered. Several fragments were joined together to preserve the full dimensions of a pan tile, measuring about 54 by 45 uh, centimeters. We thank Kyle Joswa, too, for his help on this. The form of this tile is consistent with tiles found at Thebes, Gla, and Mitru. So I show you some tiles from uh, Gla here. And this is one of our cover tiles, our very distinctive round cover tiles. So in summary, the LH3C destructions come in two phases, both of which are paralleled at Lefkan D. The unburnt level corresponds to Lefkan D1A, and the burnt destructions find good parallels in Lefkan D1B. The second phase at Lefkan D is represented by households also destroyed by fire. And evidence from Elion suggests that the two destructions are roughly contemporary, indicating regional instability at this time. So moving to the southwest, uh, selective excavations have revealed here at least three uh, different structures which have well-defined phasing. And this is an aerial view of the southwest. So we were in the north, now we've moved to the south. Um, the earliest building that we have exposed thus far can be called Building A. And it's marked in blue, which you see here and here with the pointer. Um, <clears throat> this was excavated mostly in 2012 there's a small room with a pebble surface exposed uh, just over here, dating to the 3B period. This is, again, the palatial period, the period of uh, the tablets at Thebes when Elion is a secondary center, as we see it. This structure uh, is modified and par partially reused, as is the case for most of our structures here. It was destroyed by an intense fire, preserving small finds and numeral, uh, numerous mendable ceramics. 
The, um, floor, the ceramics include deep bowls, none with monochrome interiors, uh, a near complete linear basin, uh, two stirrup jars, uh, one a coarse fabric type, which you can see just here, and then the other a much finer kind with a uh, rosette pattern uh, along the top there. The destruction of building A is thought to date to very late in the 3B2 period based on some incipient 3C features like the linear deep bowls and the mon with monochrome interiors. A violin bow fibula, uh, which has very good comparanda, which you can see here, uh, also dates uh, primarily uh, from LH3B2 onwards, and this comes from uh, this level as well. And finally, our most intriguing find of our project over the last four years uh, dates to the end of the palace period. And this is an ivory head. Uh, this is a small ivory carving depicting a human head cut flat across the back, as you can see here, uh, with facial, facial features of an Eastern style. It comes from the LH3B2 level, but its features are unique among Aegean ivories. Comparisons with uh, imported Syrian carving of a human head from uh, Mycenae, the cult center, is perhaps the closest parallel uh, for, the Bronze Age, for, our Bronze Age, for our Bronze Age context, uh, but it is different enough to encourage us to look for other comparanda. So this is the head from Mycenae, and this is our head in detail. Uh, the incised eyebrows, for example, are reminiscent of the ivory triad from Mycenae, though it is much early, the ivory triad is much earlier than our head. Uh, these are the incised uh, eyebrows as I'm talking about, and you can see them there as well. Um, but there are some other features uh, do show similarities with archaic Anatolian carvings, as you can see from this uh, uh, standing ivory figure. The eyes of, of this head are inlaid with bitumen and perhaps with silver or lead uh, pins, as you can see uh, here, and uh, that is also something we don't really have uh, parallels for. So we suggest that this may be an, Im an Eastern import to Boeotia at this time. So above the palatial level uh, is building B, uh, dating to the LH3C early period. This is the age that I was talking about in the Northwest as well. Uh, this chronological phase is more, uh, fully, was more fully represented in the Northwest, as I discussed, but the contiguous walls that we have from uh, uh, the Southwest here in orange uh, are some of our most significant and, and large-scale architecture. So in this 3C period, this post-palatial period, we actually have one of our largest buildings. We, there, the building is so large that we haven't fully exposed um, its, its full, uh, full size. Although the architecture, um, let's see, let me go on here. Yes, here you can see uh, this is part of that uh, building B, as we call it. Adjacent and continuing to the north of this area is at a later level is building C, uh, dating to the LH3C middle. High quality ceramics of this period were found outside building C uh, and in the construction levels of the building. So we, can, we focused our attention on this building at a a slightly higher level and a later date. Although the architecture is poorly preserved, the fragmentary finds include highly elaborate forms, such as pictorial pottery. As you can see here, we have a few uh, fish calithoi. This is the fragment, and here's, an, or here's another uh, fish crater. Um, we have ring vases, which you can see here, um, which are not usual for a settlement context. We have a... And the, a, and then we also have this very impressive uh, LH3C middle chariot crater. Uh, you can see the body of a horse and the fragments of a chariot. Here's the a fragment of perhaps a second horse that may not even go with, with this horse. And then this is the fragment of the chariot and the, the wheel here. Um, so all of this is very substantial, and this is a very large size uh, vessel. In addition, uh, we have fragments of bull figures, both from the Northwest and the Southwest. We probably have at least four of them, uh, perhaps even more. We have various parts. We have uh, horns here, we have legs, and uh, body parts as well. All that go with, uh, many of them came from, from this area of this uh, 3C middle uh, structure. These uh, bull figures have close parallels with finds from cultic uh, parts of this, the site at the Amaclion 
at Tiran's and also at Philoco P. So together, these all point to ceremonial activity um, at our site. Uh, it may provide some cultic context for whatever is happening at our site and help us understand also the, the numerous Mycenaean figurines that we have uh, from, this, from our excavation as well. And I just show you a few of the Mycenaean figurines. So our evidence for material after the 3C middle period is very rare. We see a hiatus of about 500 years when the site was relatively unoccupied. Among the context of both the Northwest and the Southwest, isolated evidence for ar archaic activity seems to be only cultic in nature. Ceramics are exclusively drinking vessels and miniatures, uh, which accompany lamps, cap copper alloy fiale, as you see here, and numerous other uh, later uh, figurines. And these are found just above the late Bronze Age levels. So all of this material, however, uh, and all of this material, unfortunately, comes from secondary context. We don't have a, a, a clear context for this material up on the Acropolis. We do, however, and here's some more of the figurines. This one is actually from the Northwest uh, as well, uh, up just above those three sea levels that I, that I already discussed. Um, we do have better evidence for archaic activity uh, from the south and the southeast. Uh, we can also see a direct engagement with the Bronze Age remains uh, along the eastern side of our uh, site. So this area uh, is dominated by the polygonal wall, which comes along here, uh, and uh, this uh, a ramped entranceway, which I'll discuss in just a minute. So before our work here, uh, the exposed wall uh, covered, extended for about 80 meters, uh, beginning at the tower on the south. Our excavations have uh, uncovered a second tower now to the north as well, and I'll discuss that in just a minute. The wall shows drafted margins, leveling courses, and anatherosis characteristic of a late archaic date for the construction. Uh, we are very happy to have Ben Marsh of Bucknell University joined our team to investigate quarry sources for the polygonal blocks of this wall and to help dissect the construction techniques. So with collaborative research, we should be able to combine the geographer's results with detailed stratigraphical analysis of the test trenches we've made to present a full understanding of this very significant construction project. So to recover more precise information about the polygonal wall's architectural form and chronology, we opened two test trenches, and you can see them here uh, from the Mamoni plane, I'll call it. <laughs> um, the one sounding was open with the aim of recovering evidence for the construction date of the wall. Excavating uh, to about two meters in depth along the face of the wall, and this is the beginning of that chest trench here along the polygonal face. You can see the so scale of these blocks. They are truly impressive. Uh, our students um, revealed this test trench. Uh, the recovered ceramics were consistently and completely of Mycenaean date. Uh, this material, of course, predates the wall by several hundred years in its construction uh, and probably came from up, up above and washed down. Uh, while the lack of sherds securely associated with the wall's construction was a disappointment, the extent and depth of the wall foundation underscores the monumental nature of this construction project. You can see here in the trench, too, the the, the, the rough nature of the foundation stones, and then the exposed part here. It, go, it continued down much further than we uh, expected. Here's the uh, second area. The second test trench revealed information about the date of construction, as well as the architectural form of the polygonal wall project, which would come along here. So that was the first test trench, and this is the second one. Uh, this area preserves a footprint of the polygonal wall's northern tower, where the wall's curving path ends and the ramped entrance begins. So here we can see parts of the uh, er northern tower. It's unclear if the first phase of this tower was fully built. Footings and backings exist for a wall that would have created a slight projection only. Uh, and it seems that the expanded version created a northern tower with the facade measuring 6.9 meters, uh, roughly equivalent to the south tower. Uh, the foundation trench excavated in front of it to the east uh, includes sherds of later 6th century along with copious amounts of Mycenaean pottery, affirming a date for the late archaic period for the completion 
of the polygonal wall project. So I'll show you some of the sherds from this test trench. This tower also frames a ramped entry to the archaic period uh, at the site. It leads to a large threshold block, which you can see here, and here it is in detail. This uh, threshold block uh, ha was constructed in such a way and has cuttings for wooden elements and bronze pivot uh, door jams uh, that we associate with the archaic period. But interestingly, this wall made use of Mycenaean walls on the uh, south and the north side of it. So this is the threshold that is placed in between these two Mycenaean uh, constructions. So very clearly, you can see that the Mycenaean remains were of use to the people who came to the site and built the ramped entry. Again, here from the aerial, here is the threshold block. These are these massive Mycenaean walls here and here. And this is part of the polygonal wall as well that abuts it. The uh, orange are the archaic polygonal wall, and the blue is the Mycenaean constructions. And so this creates this ramped approach up to that uh, threshold. Activity at this site is well documented by miniature vessels found in great quantities, some of the numbering into the hundreds. Uh, these, which were more uh, closely dated by finds, uh, associated finds with archaic Boeotian kyliches and black figure wares, which you can see here also from this area. Uh, these drinking and miniature vessels are joined by a prolific number of female figurines. These are, you can see in situ. Uh, so far, we have a minimum count of 574 female figurines. Uh, this is based on head counts, a minimum number of basically head counts. 56 of the female figurines are complete. The many thousands of figurine fragments total 57 kilograms in weight. So it's been a huge amount of processing uh, in, our, in our conservation lab. The focus of this religious activity is not clear in terms of an identifiable sacred space or the identity of the figures worshiped. The only textual reference to a cult at Elion dates to the Roman period. Uh, Plutarch records that three maiden daughters of the river god Scamander, uh, a new name for the Inicus River adjacent to the site, uh, were worshiped here. Although he writes that the Parthenoi were honored still in his own era, uh, none of the votive material we've recovered thus far dates to the Hellenistic or Roman periods. So there is a disconnect there. The, uh, we also excavated west of the threshold to understand what was happening as you came up through this ramp. Here it is again in plan. And this was the area we explored to figure out what was the threshold leading to. Unfortunately, the remains have been disturbed since the Ottoman period, and no shrine area has been uncovered. Uh, it's possible that the cultic activity uh, turned to the south in an area that we have not yet explored. We did explore further to the west, over to here. Let me go on. And um, what we uncovered uh, was a very hard-packed pebble uh, surface dating to the Mycenaean period. And there are three, at least three levels of a beautifully hard-packed uh, pebble surface dating to the Mycenaean era in this region. So we, and we obviously have more uh, work to do in this area to try and figure out the relationship between this Mycenaean surface and this archaic threshold block here, and the figurines and the uh, Boeotian pottery that was found in the, in the approach there. So work was also conducted on the walls that border the eastern ramp leading to the threshold, as I show you here. Uh, these walls, as mentioned, uh, date by style and the finds within the matrices to the Mycenaean period. In parts, they are truly substantial, varying between three, and a half, three to five meters in thickness and preserved in some cases to two and a half meters in height. So like other Mycenaean eras of the site, oops, they are preserved to, uh, or they are modified and rebuilt over during the 3B and 3C periods. Uh, their function to us is still unclear, but it does create a very impressive bastion as you approach the site. And here you can make out perhaps some of the threshold blocks. We, we certainly have one at the base here and maybe a second one as well. Uh, this could have been a blocked entranceway uh, located just over here. Uh, so it's, it's a difficult site, to, a difficult part of the site to photograph. Uh, so our architect, Juliana Bianca, is, is, is greatly thanked for her help on this. 
Uh, toward the end of our most recent season, we uncovered an enigmatic series of walls and cobbled surfaces with material consistently dating to the early Mycenaean era and just east of the middle Helladic cistums that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk over here. Um, because our season in 2014 was drawing to a close, we were not able to reveal the full extent of this structure. This is the structure we call the blue stone structure. Uh, here you can see it again from the air. The peculiar nature of this construction with clearly delineated half walls on the exterior, cobbled surfaces uh, covering internal divisions at different uh, elevations, and a few traces of human remains during our initial excavation suggest to us that this structure had a funerary function. Of course, we look forward to fully investigating this area in 2015. And I, shall, I should say, so the, the structure would have continued over into here, and this is what we do hope to complete our excavations in uh, the coming season. And so um, <clears throat> I'd like to present at least a, a very speculative reconstruction of what this structure might have looked like. Oh, here's the cobblestones. And here's another view and the stratigraphy as it goes into the bulk here. And here's the a tentative uh, reconstruction, a conjectural reconstruction. You can see it was just done today. <laughs> um, so if this is an early Mycenaean funerary structure, it adds to the diversity of burial types in this formative period. Uh, this would be the period contemporary with the shaft graves at Mycenae, for example. So uh, enabling all of this work is our international team of specialists and students working on our project, and we sincerely thank them all. We are also grateful to the communities in which we live and work uh, during the summer. We welcome visitors to our site throughout our any time. Anyone is very welcome to come and visit us. Uh, and each year now, we've been concluding our season's work uh, with an open house in the village, and we invite all of our neighbors and friends uh, to come up to the site some evening. And so you can see uh, it's proved fairly popular uh, within the region, and, and we're very, very happy to be sharing what we've learned uh, with the people in the area. And here is Brian and Mrs. Harami also lecturing to the crowds, and we put uh, areas up for children. They can help start drawing pottery together, and uh, everybody seems to have a very good time. So we also have to acknowledge that this is an incredible opportunity and privilege for us and for our students. Our students come from all over the world. They are primarily Canadian students and, and American students. And we acknowledge and are extremely grateful uh, to the Greek Ministry of Culture and to all of our Greek colleagues uh, in this archaeological community who have supported us uh, over these years. Um, and so I leave you here with our acknowledgments, our funding sources, and all of our collaborators. So thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you so much. You really have some interesting finds. Would you like to add some comments now, or should we just let people yeah, ask? Okay. Um, I have lots of questions, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, well, one is the position. Now that you mentioned the, the uh, um, possible fortification wall of the Mycenaean period, wasn't it placed rather oddly on the hill, sort of cutting through the middle or something? I, I, <coughs> I don't know if I said fortification wall. But no, but <laughs> <laughs> it is a substantial wall, yeah. for sure, and it, it does follow the natural topography of the hill, okay. um, and it's heavily modified by the archaic builders who come along with that threshold too. So um, it is hard to get a full feel for what the how the Mycenaean extent would go. Mm -hmm. say, did you want to say add anything? Yeah, some of it is um, is clearly several meters high. That doorway um, is hard to get to currently, but it, it's very clear. Other parts of it uh, appear more like a platform. It doesn't necessarily have that kind of depth. So we have a lot to do to sort of piece that together and interpret how it might extend, not necessarily around the entire site, but uh, around that area. It's definitely defining the space. Uh, but then possible a funeral uh, uh, structure would be on a higher level than that? Uh, yeah, that is what's peculiar yeah. to us too. And yeah. the middle Helladic tombs are fairly high up uh -huh. there as well. Okay. But nothing's built over those. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, questions? 
I would like to ask you if you have um, <coughs> uh, recognized um, uh, areas of uh, specialization uh, during the Mycenaean times in your ar architecture. The, so these finds were uh, um, uh, from a workshop or uh, this kind of stuff? Yeah. Uh, the, the jewelry mold, for example, came from the southern part of that northwest area, and that, and that area is heavily uh, disturbed by pitting and, and animal burrows and other things, so that's a bit difficult. Um, but to suggest any kinds of true workshops, we, we, I mean, we, we think we've uncovered a lot, but there really is a lot left to be explored there. So to, to talk about specialized areas is a, uh, we're a little bit, uh, we're, it's a little bit early for us to say that, yeah. But the spindle whorls and the loom weights that I was, I'm particularly interested in too, they seem to come from, very, from all of the areas in the southwest and the northwest. Uh, and the second one, um, and, and this um, uh, Fenera uh, uh, construction, it has uh, similarities with the tumulus of, in Sini, for example, with this mm. pebble, uh, uh -huh. uh, large pebble, uh, pebbles there, and it is the same period. So uh, Asini. I think yeah. Asini, yeah. The tumulus, yeah. And I think it's a good uh, f mm, comparison. Thank to you that. very much. This is why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we're in Ag Agaeus. Thank you. <clears throat> I have, if no, well, okay. <laughs> First, thank you for your presentation. It's always refreshing to hear about settlements and not citadels and palaces all the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, and my question is about the funerary building. What is the evidence for it being funerary? Why not to be an ordinary building? that said that we have some sea stops of early Mycenaean dates, that means nothing. It's very usual to have them intramuros, mm -hmm. even if there are cysts uh, built and so on. Yeah. So, and uh, in late Helladic one or two, there are local elites, there are not the palaces yet, so they need the kind of uh, a large building, a manor. Mm -hmm. So, if yeah. you don't have specific evidence for funerary use, so... Mm -hmm. may be open. Yeah. So, so there is fragmentary human skeletal material. Inside. Mm -hmm. Inside, but we've only taken a small sample mm -hmm. to go down with them. But mm -hmm. more importantly, it's a very peculiar structure. It's a it, it is not built like a normal building mm -hmm. um, in terms of it has some walls, yeah, some of which have huge orthostates. A tripartite. Really stuff, substantial. Yeah. Yeah. And then these flat stones on top of them that are currently sort of pitched in. It all mm -hmm. looks like it's collapsed. So, um, and the cobbled areas are above that. So you have some original construction, and then, and then you have these pavements exactly. over it. So yeah. we see it as something that is. Um, there are several periods of activity here, perhaps all within the early Mycenaean period. And then again, nothing's built directly on top of it. So, uh, well, yeah. well, that's that's unique. <laughs> Bye, thank you. And it's yeah. right in the center. Yeah. That's well, right but <coughs> we are cautious, and we don't yeah, we yeah. we don't know what it is, and we we had only about a week left of our excavation, so we so. tried to be as cautious as we could with the and, and and are leaving it for for a detailed season. And you won't actually read that in our reports. We left it unstated. <laughs> right. uh, but we thought we'd share it here tonight because yeah. we. That is so interesting. Thank yeah. you. I want to ask about uh, the uh, absolute beginnings uh, of the material, the site. Uh, these middle Helladic uh, tombs, mm -hmm. uh, were they um, positioned on virgin soil? Did you go further down or? Uh, yes. Um, so the the early, the one that's intact. Mm -hmm. One that's over here. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, there's some early material that it cuts through, so it cuts through some levels that have early Bronze Age, mm -hmm. teeny tiny shirts. Mm -hmm. um, but then, directly below, it seems to be okay. untouched. Somebody else can have the opportunity to ask a question too, or I can ask another one. <laughs> 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 Um, well, this ramp, <laughs> the Mycenaean uh, yeah. ramp, going into a room, have t are there any parallels to that? Uh, well, n we would say that the, the ramp itself is, is of the archaic period because... No, 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 the, uh, 
the uh, oh the ramp yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry yes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 there are uh, the, uh, we uh, there are parallels even at Gla some of the rooms uh -huh. leading into the the structures at Gla from our our uh, have small ramps like similar what's strange <laughs> is is that if it goes right into the room that's right in front of a hearth yeah. would, and we have not even begun to excavate that room okay. completely. Mm -hmm. So again, that's waiting. Mm -hmm. the, and th there was an internal discussion that perhaps <laughs> that ramp was a support to, to keep a wall from uh, collapsing. But I didn't believe it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Other parts of that building have um, some constructions immediately outside the wall. Mm -hmm. Not, nothing that you would call a real buttress. Mm -hmm. um, but again, something that it's not a bench, it's a... <laughs> some small extension okay. of the architecture. You mentioned at the beginning that you did a geophysical survey mm -hmm. before that. So to which extent, after having done a couple of excavation seasons, do you see an overlap between the geophysical results and your excavation results? Mm -hmm. And did the massive wall, you don't call fortification wall, show up on the measurements? <laughs> yeah, no. no. The geophysical survey that we did was uh, limited uh, financially. In, in 2009, we didn't have very much funds. <laughs> we still don't. But um, so that was just on that south part. Uh, and what it showed was a large number of walls on top of each other. So we did want to try to get a one-to-one -one correspondence by excavation, and uh, it, it, that wasn't the case. We found a lot of walls, too, <laughs> and um, so it encouraged us that there was a lot of material underneath there. Uh, per, we, perhaps we you know, could refine the data more. Yeah, if you see in, in what's currently shown, so it's the, the area in the top, that southwest trench that corresponds with the geophysics most closely. Uh, and preserved in the corner, which is currently the bottom right of that, there's a, a set of boulder Here, rubble yeah. across that. There was a lot of that over much of this area. So we think that provided a lot of feedback for the geophysics, which is hard to read out. Okay. Um, but it's been no, not possible to find a close coordination yet. Yeah. And may, may I add another query? Um, may I, I may have missed it. Did you date the massive Mycenaean wall yet? Is it also 3B too late, or could it be even 3C early? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and again, partly it's the several phases. It's the fact that it's built and closed in. It looks like there's one threshold on top of another. Um, so it could all be within the 3C. Thank you. Anybody else? Or if you're too shy, maybe a little bit of wine can help. <laughs> so we have some wine waiting outside, and we can uh, discuss further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.